Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in Malmö. Uh, the last time I was here was for four and a half hours uh, about three years ago, but I managed to see quite a lot of the, of the city in that, in that, in that time. Um, uh, and it was a real pleasure to be able to come in yesterday and have a, have a tour around and see what uh, regeneration and transformation was taking place here. Um, I'm Jonathan Reynolds. I'm uh, part of, uh, uh, you might regard this, I suppose, as the UK equivalent of the Lund uh, Centre for, for Trade Research uh, at Oxford University, uh, the Oxford Institute of Retail Management, where I'm the academic director. And um, the work we do is, is, again, very similar to that of um, uh, uh, colleagues in, in Lund. Uh, we've been doing this for about 30 years now, but with a much smaller team, I have to say, than, than here in Sweden. Uh, but uh, as a geographer, I have a particular interest and passion for uh, retail places and for destinations and the way in which these are evolving as a result of um, the pressures that are acting on both places and on the commercial uh, uh, business models that, uh, as Sue suggested earlier on, are actually uh, determining uh, how these places will evolve. Uh, we also do work in innovation, in retail marketing and strategy, looking at international retail performance and at supply chain management. But today I want to particularly focus on the planning and development aspects of our work and to share with you some insights into the way in which UK uh, uh, high street or downtown retailing has been responding to some of the pressures for change and to really paint a picture of, um, of town and city centres which are no longer so reliant upon retailing because they, they won't be able to be and indeed, in government policy terms in the UK, the phrase that is often being used is beyond retail as a, uh, as a theme. Uh, so again, picking up the sense in which historically retailing has been seen as a necessary anchor for commercial activity, um, perhaps we need to rethink some of those kinds of assumptions. Um, what I want to do this morning in about uh, uh, 35 minutes, and I'll leave some time for some questions, is really, uh, first of all, remind you of the kind of headlines in the new retail landscape. What are the commercial pressures that, that uh, businesses are, are facing? Um, and then focus particularly on UK retail and look at the long-term structural changes in the sector and how that's manifested in terms of the places in which retailing takes, takes uh, place. Uh, and then look at some of the physical responses to change that we see on our high streets and in our suburban and out-of-town areas as far as retailing is concerned. The biggest pressure, of course, is in response to the internet and to e-commerce and mobile commerce. And I want to share with you some research that has been done by some colleagues of mine uh, on the notion of uh, uh, e-resilient retail places. In other words, are there retail places that are particularly defensible uh, because of their location, their function, their mix, uh, uh, given the challenge of, uh, of, of non-store activities? I want to talked a bit about Oxford because I think uh, in Oxford we can see some quite interesting pressures being shown on the ground and I'll share with you some of the physical development aspects of that, uh, of that city in relation to retailing. And I'll finish off with a few sources of future uncertainty if this last week wasn't enough uncertainty for us to be uh, going on with, with uh, Mr. Trump. Um, so let me start with uh, really the headlines, I suppose. And uh, one of the, the, the major commercial events worldwide on retailing is the World Retail Congress. And this year uh, it was in Dubai in uh, spring, and it's again in, in Dubai next year. I think that kind of, in a sense, sends a message about where global retailers think the center of action is as far as retail growth is concerned. It's not in Europe. It's in, it's in the Middle East or it's in Asia uh, in terms of uh, real growth. But when the, the leaders of those businesses were talking about challenges that they were facing, these are the kinds of words that were coming up. Unprecedented change, economic fluctuations, the omni-consumer, which is a terrible word. Uh, uh, in fact, when I teach my students, we have a, a swear box in the corner. They must use the swear box if they use omni-channel or omni-consumer. I've used it twice, so I have to pay a fine now. Um, importantly, the notion of e-commerce as a destroyer of value. For, for conventional retail firms, because as we know, uh, it becomes harder and harder to be uh, price competitive as a conventional retailer. Uh, but then the, the opportunities, you know, opportunities for new creativity and innovation, opportunities for sustainability, but also the requirement to build not just environmental sustainability, but also financial sustainability for the conventional commercial models that are around. And that will require, as many of these individuals talked about, you know, different kinds of leadership in, in, in retail businesses. So some tremendous challenges facing the sector overall. 
And if we think about what is at risk uh, across Europe, then we see in retailing three and a half million businesses. We see uh, it making up 15% of all private sector enterprises. We have something like 152 million square meters of shopping center space across Europe. The real estate, the inertia, the investment in that real estate, can it move fast enough to realign itself with the new retail landscape that is emerging in particular places? Nearly three trillion euros in turnover, half uh, a trillion in terms of gross value added, employing nearly 19 million people and paying a lot of tax to local and central government. And one of the reasons, of course, that retailing is seen as being an anchor of local areas is the fact that it provides a tax base for many local authorities, particularly in the UK at the moment, uh, where there is you know, central government cutback in terms of support for local government. The support of local business taxes is absolutely critical to the maintenance of, uh, of good order in local areas. So there's a lot at risk, given the retail sector is such a huge part of the European economy. Uh, of course, retailing has always been about change. And uh, there's some great tools available now on Google, not least uh, uh, the Google Books Ngram Viewer, and I recommend it to you. Uh, this searches uh, books for the last 200, 300 years, um, the contents. Uh, and what I've got here is, uh, is mentions of high streets, mentions of shopping. And as you can see, uh, shopping became a subject of, of literary interest from around about 1900 onwards and grew very slowly, but quite reasonably, up until about, about 2000. And then shopping is no longer quite so fashionable to write about as it used to be. Um, but you also see other factors. Supermarket in red here, starting to kick off around about 1945, becoming more and more popular, then, then dipping away in the, the, last, the last 10 years. And then e-commerce from around about 1995, uh, growing fast. And then because we stopped calling it e-commerce, uh, becoming less fashionable to write about in that kind of term. So we can see that, that high streets have always been about change and retailing in particular places has always been about change. But it's a complex Rubik's Cube of an issue. So uh, we have you know, a whole raft of different stakeholders to manage, uh, public sector, private sector, voluntary sector, all of whom have vested interests, all of whom have a vision of what they want to achieve from their own goals. Coordinating that mix uh, is an enormous challenge for established urban areas um, and uh, uh, achieving a common and convergent goal in places is really difficult. We've been working in this area now for, say, for nearly 30 years and a lot of our research, this actually is a, 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 a piece of work from 1988, uh, was called the health of the high street. So it's not a new problem. <laughs> uh, this is a problem that has been with us certainly in the UK for nearly a generation now as these places have changed their role and in particular in the last generation uh, the suburbanization, decentralization that we've seen in, in most developed economies uh, has taken place also in the UK. But I want to talk about some of the contemporary forces for disruption because they are probably more substantial and more significant than we have seen previously. Let's just look at the, the kind of four contexts for this. First in terms of economic change. Uh, and what we can say first of all is that growth is hard to come by and will be even harder to come by over the next few years. On this map, green is bad from an economic growth potential, and red is good. So you, as you can see, if you look at Europe, then really it's only Ireland and parts of Eastern Europe that are growing in the next year at more than 3% in terms of GDP. Uh, much of Northern Europe, Western Europe, uh, much of North, well, all of North America, uh, Russia, Australia, some parts of the Middle East, you know, growing uh, at less than 3%, and in some cases, less than 0%, so in other words, declining. Um, and it's to China, India, uh, parts of Africa, and parts of Southeast Asia, one looks for the substantial growth in economic terms. So here in Sweden, in the UK as well, we're looking at a, a very stagnant market. Um, and although the UK has kind of bucked the trend a bit in the last uh, couple of years, the recent uncertainty of the last few months has, has given uh, people pause about the, uh, the nature of investment in retail places. The second issue is around geopolitical forces. And some work done a while ago, um, before this man came on the scene, um, around global strategic trends, talked about over the next 20 years, 25 years, a time of transition for geopolitics. Uh, changing climate, rapid population growth, issues with security, 
uh, resource scarcity, a resurgence in populism and ideology, and a shift in global power from west to east, which again, we see around us. We see it in the UK, we see it here in Sweden, in terms of many of these kinds of uncertainties, meaning that the kinds of investments that we used to think had longevity are actually perhaps problematic in terms of their usefulness to us. And then consumers also share that degree of uncertainty. So here we have a, a chart of uh, consumers' confidence over the last uh, 15, 16 years. And this measures confidence by asking people if they feel, in effect, more or less confident about the next 12 months. Uh, and they net that off. So any score above zero, there are more optimists than pessimists. And below zero, more pessimists than optimists. So as you can see, uh, by and large, uh, Sweden is optimistic. <laughs> Uh, and becoming slightly more so. The UK was optimistic for about uh, two years, uh, uh, but look what happened. So that little dip there um, is the uh, Brexit vote, um, which is, uh, is there. <laughs> uh, but we're not quite as bad off as Greece, so this is Greece. <laughs> okay. So uh, quite a few more pessimists than, uh, than optimists. Uh, there was a, clearly a momentary kind of frisson of optimism there, but uh, it disappeared again. Um, so really, uh, Europe as a whole, which is the dotted line here, European Union of 28, has been really just bumping along underneath zero for most of the last 15 years. So op optimism is in, sh in short supply. And when there is a short supply of optimism, there is generally a short supply of uh, discretionary spending and, and, and so on. And the final uh, jigsaw piece is around technology. And of course, we know that online sales continue to grow. Um, and across Europe, we're talking probably about 8% of all EU retail sales uh, now going through uh, online uh, mobile sources. And that varies from around about 2% to around about uh, 16 or 17% in some markets. Um, and uh, a good uh, getting on for a third of that is through mobile uh, channels uh, across Europe at the moment, around about 59 billion euros in, the last, in, in this year is estimated to be that kind of uh, figure. Um, and we can see the, um, the countries at risk on this. So I was in China in August, and the, 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 the massive transformation of China, particularly the top tier and second tier cities, in terms of the growth of e-commerce, has now pushed China into the lead in terms of the largest non-store retail market worldwide. Uh, about 30% of internet sales last year. The US now second, 27%. But notice the UK is third, which is not a very comfortable position to be in if you're a traditional retailer looking to grow your sales from a stagnant market with 7% of the world's online sales taking place in that market. So again, if you think about the combined effects of, uh, of, of that on um, the profitability and prosperity of place, that becomes really problematic. Now what I've got next is a little animation which shows the growth of internet retail sales over the next five or six years. And the, size of the circle is the amount of uh, total retail sales. The y-axis is the amount of uh, penetration internet sales, so 10%, 15%, 20%. Uh, and uh, along here is the uh, total amount of internet retailing sales. Uh, and what you probably just spotted there was that big blue circle overtaking the other two. That's China. Uh, so uh, if, I, if I run that again, you can see the, um, the way in which uh, North America, Europe, China in dark blue. <laughs> uh, that's a forecast for the next kind of three, four years. It's actually going faster than that, I think. Uh, and the orange circles are European countries. So you see the smaller ones of around 15, 16% uh, and 10%. Uh, that's Sweden, uh, Denmark, Finland in particular, uh, much more buoyant markets in terms of online. The larger three uh, orange circles are the UK, France, and Germany. But it's really, uh, the interesting feature is the fact that uh, the US has overtaken uh, Europe, Europe as a whole, that light blue circle, and China has outstripped everybody in respect of that growth. Now, I show you that simply because it demonstrates that uh, the action is not necessarily here uh, in Europe. It's actually elsewhere uh, in terms of uh, physical growth. But what have been the physical responses to change in the UK as a result of those, those forces? Because the UK has been particularly exposed to these kinds of pressures. Um, and you know, for many store-based retailers, we have a situation where there are many, many more smarter consumers who have access to good price information, who uh, know uh, about product characteristics, and can be much more selective and much more discriminating in their choice about where they shop. Um, 
That means, other things being equal, that for traditional retails, we have lower sales and profit per square foot. Um, and uh, what little surplus there is, is driven into price competition by those firms. So it's a very aggressive, very competitive environment with margins driven down. In, in physical terms, that means that your store base is incurring increasing costs without necessarily getting the revenues to pay for those costs. And so we're seeing really chain expansion of the bigger retailers in the UK at an all-time low. Uh, and with many companies downsizing the space to try and trade more efficiently, more profitably from existing space. The problem is we don't know where this is headed. So one of the most uh, trusted kind of agents that works in this area in the UK, a business called Luntz & Michinal, quoted as saying, we have learnt that second guessing what retailers will want in the future is a fool's game, as not even they fully understand where technology is taking them. That's not a very comforting kind of phrase to be faced with when you're thinking about physical investments in real estate, which could be quite durable in terms of their, uh, their impact. And of course that means that um, a lot of existing real estate is in the process not of growing new outlets and new centres, but in refurbishing and redesigning itself. Uh, it was interesting seeing the uh, development here in Malmo, the, the, refurbished, uh, the refurbishment going on in the centre uh, here. But uh, across the UK, nearly 40% of UK shopping malls are planning refurbishment over the next three years of all sizes, not just the middle sized. Uh, so Meadow Hall is a, one of our biggest regional out of town shopping centres in the north of England, planning a 50 million pound refurbishment. And there is a very, very small pipeline of new development uh, because we have seen a polarisation of risk between uh, larger, lower risk places where real estate investments can be seen to be safer uh, and medium sized places which can be seen to be riskier. And we've also seen closures. So uh, retail business failures, uh, number of stores closing on the left, peaked at around about 2008 during the financial crisis with around about 7,000 stores closing, uh, affecting something in the order of 70,000 jobs. Uh, and another small peak in 2012, but we can now start to see again, uh, we haven't even finished 2016 yet, still two months to go, uh, an uptick in store closures and in jobs lost by major brands, most recently this BHS format uh, with about 9,500 jobs lost. Um, and um, uh, uh, this is a, a major brand on our downtown, uh, on our high streets, which is now closed. So we've done work over the last few years in tracking this behaviour. And let me then turn to, to some of this work. Uh, how have those high streets changed? over the last few years? Can we measure the characteristics of those, chain, that, those changes and what new things are happening? Because it's not all just about closure, although some of it's about closure, some of it's about new kinds of uses, new kinds of developments. Uh, one piece of work we did uh, uh, was to, to gather data on a two-year period from 2011 to 2013, looking at the change in the mix and characteristics of retail trading on UK high streets. And I want to pick out kind of four themes from that. Uh, the context of this is actually a, a fall uh, in the larger networks of stores, particularly in things like clothing retailing, where we see really quite big declines in uh, up to 5 6% in the, term, in the numbers of multiple clothing retailing uh, outlets. And clothing has been very badly affected, uh, not just in the UK, but I think worldwide, uh, in North America too, by um, uh, some really interesting secular changes in the way in which people buy clothing. Uh, Behaviours have changed quite dramatically. Um, but in that kind of context, we've seen four broader sets of change. One is what I call the effects of digitalisation. These are retail outlets that are no longer needed because actually they have been completely substituted for pretty well by uh, online sources. Uh, in some cases, there's a bit of a resurgence, uh, but um, uh, the price that has been paid is the closure of many outlets in areas like video libraries, computer games, news agents selling physical newspapers rather than looking at it on your tablet, home entertainment multiples, record tapes and CDs, booksellers, uh, and a whole range of, of kind of substituted product ranges that are no longer in needed to be shopped in stores. And we've seen something like a 5% fall in all shops in the UK in, in, those, in those particular categories. Um, so a substantial kind of shift from digitalisation, 
And that's before we even get to the, if you like, the uh, other categories which are not substituted for. Second feature is around a move to value. So consumers' awareness of price, increased awareness of price, and their search not just for the lowest price but for the best value has led to significant growth in value-related retailing. Not just second-hand and discount shops, but also shops which offer a, a good value range. So the best example would be Primark in the UK, which is a, a very low-priced um, uh, clothing retailer, clothing variety store, which has been remarkably successful over the last 10 years uh, as, a, as a business in, in city centres. But a very different kind of retailer to the ones you would have seen, let's say, 15 or 20 years ago. And there are now about 10,000 shops in the UK in the value category, uh, compared to around about uh, five or 6,000 uh, 10 years ago. The third one is what I call the deprivation mix. And this, in a sense, was a response to the, the economic downturn in, the, in 2008, 2009. We saw a big growth in, in pawnbrokers, in check cashing. Uh, we saw a growth in particular places where there was Im immigrant labour being used because money was being repatriated back to the home countries. Uh, and that's a very kind of specific uh, uh, incident. So we saw it in East London, we saw it in rural parts, agricultural parts of the UK, where um, high streets were, were taking on service roles, uh, financial roles for those particular individuals. And the fourth example is what I've called health and beauty. But actually, it's an example, I suppose, of things you can't do online. So it's very difficult to do your makeup online. Uh, um, whereas the growth we've seen substantially, around about 10% uh, growth over that two-year period, more than 2,500 outlets in health and beauty, nail salons, hairdressers, uh, skin care specialists, uh, Botox injections, that kind of thing. Uh, and in fact, there are, in the UK, there are now more nail salons than Chinese restaurants. Um, so it's, it's easier to get your, uh, your nails done than to uh, have a Chinese meal uh, in the UK. So we've seen some quite interesting changes in the mix. And this is not all bad. You know, it's, it's simply a matter of an evolution of the, of the retail offer in those places. A question that we, we might ask, though, is to what extent there is um, uh, a set of e-resilient places. Are there some physical places in the UK which are more resistant than others to the impact of the internet and of online shopping? And what do we know about those kinds of places? We've been doing some work over the, uh, the last couple of years with uh, a government-sponsored project called the Consumer Data Research Centre, which is a, uh, a, a, a 10 million euro uh, project uh, between three universities um, uh, analysing retailer data uh, about the, the ge geography, if you like, of demand and supply. And uh, what we've done is to put together the supply-side information that we have from uh, some... Uh, organizations that collect information on where retailing is and how it's characterized with information on demand. So this is a, a Nottingham, a city in uh, the East Midlands of England, where we're looking at the internet usage of, of local neighborhoods uh, and classifying that. So for example, here in red, we have the E unengaged, those people who are not online, and they're to be found in a particular part of the city. So you can map this kind of demand surface for online shopping. We can put it alongside some of the, uh, the supply side um, potential of certain places because certain places will have perhaps shops that are more vulnerable, people that shop online. And we can start to look at the resilience of particular places. Uh, and what we end up with is um, uh, a set of places which uh, are uh, most vulnerable in red or uh, most resilient in dark green. And you can see actually that's those of you that know some of the literature on, on the UK may not have heard of the north-south divide. Well, actually, this doesn't seem to be following through. There is no real north-south divide here. We see places in red and pink that are vulnerable all over the country. Um, and we see equally uh, resilient places, fewer of them, but equally all over the country. Uh, but particularly in London, uh, particularly in, in, in larger metropolitan areas like Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, and Newcastle upon Tyne, the top right there uh, in England, but a lot of vulnerable places in the middle. And when we look at uh, um, the southeast of England in, in a little closer detail, what we have here is uh, a mapping of what we call high exposure catchments. So any shopping catchment areas that are circled in blue are identified as being vulnerable uh, centres. And you can see many of them are smaller, many of them are infill centres between larger, larger uh, cities. 
So uh, if we look at somewhere like uh, Reading, for example, here, Reading itself is secure and resilient, but actually some of the smaller places adjacent to Reading are more vulnerable, uh, according to the, the analyses that, that, that we're doing at the moment. So this starts to provide a kind of, something of a tool to understand uh, how we can approach these kinds of places in a more intelligent way. Uh, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it worth safeguarding some of these kinds of places in the same way that we might safeguard a, a larger city like Maidstone or Reading or Guildford? So it, at least it provides some evidence and some data for choices by planning authorities. Let me turn uh, now to a, a small case study. And I wanted to talk about Oxford. Uh, it's an interesting city. Uh, all cities are distinctive and interesting. You know? uh, but actually, uh, Oxford is, is a curious place because it's always been uh, undershopped. There's always been less retailing than uh, shoppers would like to see, partly because it's a historic town. It's very difficult for uh, commercial operators to develop the size of stores that they want in a city like Oxford. Um, but it has tried its best to try and become a retail place for its residents. Um, to put it into context, uh, Oxford is, is not to the northwest of London, about an hour away, uh, just there. And uh, what I've got here is the, uh, is the, the amount of spend. Uh, this is in, in sterling here, but in euros there. About 750 euro, million euros, typical spend for the Oxford catchment. But you can see um, how hemmed in Oxford is by Milton Keynes, by Reading, and by the massive influence of London, central London, which is only an hour away by train. Um, and just to the northwest there is, uh, is, 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 is Birmingham. Uh, so you have, uh, in a sense, a city which is hemmed around by much bigger and arguably better retail offers. So what, does, what, should, what should Oxford do in relation to its retail offer? Um, uh, particularly in the context of online competition, because the e-resilience data tells us actually that uh, the Ox Oxford residents, uh, something like 12% of all retail sales in that Oxford catchment are online. So it's a substantial uh, penetration of the overall market by, by online retailing. So what should um, Oxford do as a, as a, as a place? Well, uh, when I was an undergraduate student in Oxford in the 1970s, uh, a shopping centre was built. Uh, called the Westgate Centre. It's what you call a historic managed shopping centre. Built in 1972, it had 30 shop units. Um, and you'd think, well, that was, you know, that's a good investment. Perhaps they should refurbish that. It's only taken 40 years uh, for them to get around to be refurbishing it. Again, this is a challenge in many English historic centres. It's very hard to do inner uh, centre redevelopment because of the historic nature of the centre. Uh, it's far easier to build out of town. And that, again, reduces the, the commercial benefit of retail activity to the local government within uh, the central area. Um, so 45 years later, in fact, we have now underway a major refurbishment and re extension of that uh, city centre uh, uh, development. And what we see here is um, the, the, the historic centre of Oxford is, is here. The shopping street is, is here. Our business school is down at the West End. But this whole development here is around about 75,000 square metres of new uh, mixed-use development uh, with uh, homes, cinema, the classic kind of mix of, uh, of multi-use retail and non-retail activity. Um, but is it too late? You know, the challenge is, will people come to it? Oxford is a very difficult place to park in. It costs uh, eight pounds a day to park in Oxford. Uh, would you really want to bring your car into the city. Uh, certainly you can come by public transport, by train or by park and ride bus and park on the outskirts of the city. But that's a real hassle, that's a real difficulty, particularly with the weather, which actually in the UK is worse than today uh, in Malmo at the moment. This is, I, think, I think it's called English weather, this is? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you can see that you know, the, these, this kind of new development is very substantial uh, and certainly substantial in a historic city like Oxford. It's a, it's a big parcel of land that is being uh, redeveloped in this way. Uh, opening next November. And um, the challenge is, in the meantime, in those 45 years, we've seen substantial growth in competing retail spaces, which are of higher quality and arguably you know, uh, uh, have larger numbers of stores. So the new development will have 70 stores, uh, but the Reading uh, Oracle Centre, which is only uh, half an hour away, has 90 shops, uh, is actually bigger, 
uh, it has two department stores. Milton Keynes is a new city, has uh, a massive uh, area of uh, retailing, 150,000 plus square meters, four department stores, very, very cheap parking. Why would you want to come to Oxford to do retail? So there is a big risk for the local authority in giving permission for this central development. Will people actually be able to get to it uh, for it to be successful? Could it be the last one of its kind? And if that were not enough, uh, our most successful retail centre in uh, uh, the southeast of England, moment, outside London, is actually a factory outlet centre called Mr. Village, which was uh, 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 opened in 1992. Uh, Vista is a small town, about half an hour to the northeast of Oxford. It only has 30,000 population, but every year it gets 6 million visitors to a shopping centre. 6 million visitors in a town of 30,000. This shopping centre is located right by a motorway junction. It's very convenient. Uh, even uh, the Princess of Wales shops there, so it must be good. Um, has 100 <coughs> stores, so twice the number that are going to be in this new Westgate development. Uh, and it's among the most productive and efficient real estate space in the country. The turnover per square meter is around about 37,000 euros per square meter. Very intensively trading. Now, the reason it's intensively trading is it's very, very busy. This picture here is the publicity picture. Okay? Let me show you the reality. Here's the, uh, here's the reality. Okay? So this is, uh, and you can see it's been raining, so it's not great. Uh, but it's packed. Can you see any English faces there? Uh, in fact, Mr. Village is the second most popular destination for Chinese tourists outside London in the UK. They get coaches, trains, there is a train station dedicated to this shopping centre. Uh, and when you get there on the train, the announcements are in Arabic, Mandarin and Japanese. You arrive at the station. This is a dedicated uh, shopping city, in effect. And indeed, uh, uh, as the owner says, uh, Scott Malkin, Found retail, we're not in the athlete business, we're in the consumer travel business. Okay? And he's now building uh, some of the malls, he's building two in China, one in Shanghai, for example, that are opening this year. Uh, but as you can see, the queues of traffic to get there, the excitement of trying to park, uh, the, the frustrations of not being able to find a parking space. You know? uh, who said store shopping was dead? Yeah? <laughs> Uh, well, these, these drivers might be, but they're, you know, they're, um, they're, uh, you know, they are eager to go to these kinds of places. And what is curious about this is there is a shoe shop in here, uh, the Clark's brand name, uh, which is uh, actually uh, selling shoes made in China to Chinese tourists, <laughs> which they then take back to China. Uh, and actually, it costs them less money to buy the shoes in the UK than in China because of tariffs. <laughs> Uh, so, and they have a bag that says Oxford on it when they travel back. So it's all about uh, shopping as tourism from this point of view. So Oxford, I think, has a really interesting challenge ahead of it. Um, you know, I think uh, what kinds of tenants go into this new centre is going to be really important. I think they're mo looking to have luxury end tenants, uh, so high class retail uh, brands that are not present in other uh, southeast uh, England locations. Um, However, you know, it's a real challenge uh, uh, for the city to get new shoppers in because the accessibility is very poor. We're going to hear a little later on this morning about the challenge and the opportunity of access, I think. Um, uh, there is perhaps opportunity for small retail businesses to move into the spaces that are left. Uh, but frankly, at the moment, Oxford is just catching up with provision elsewhere in terms of retailing. And it's by no means guaranteed that this new development will be remotely successful. Uh, given some of the infrastructure and structural issues of the city uh, and access issues, and given the, the way trade has already been diverted to online and to places like Bista Village. Now, in the last few minutes, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time looking even further ahead at some of the sources of future uncertainty that might affect places. And I've got three very brief kind of uh, uh, summaries into that just in the last two or three minutes before we take some questions. Um, the first of these is... Uh, around customer intelligence. And I think I've already hinted at the fact that we have smarter uh, consumers who are more able to gather information about products and prices. Well, we're going to see more and more of this over the next few years. We're going to see what I would call the destruction of the value that intermediaries have created as retailers. So retailers, in some senses, are businesses that exist because they make choice simpler for you as consumers. 
uh, and uh, they're good at their job because they buy the right kinds of things and they make available ranges of products in places that are accessible and convenient. However, consumers are getting better at finding information on the things that they want uh, and we have all kinds of things happening in terms of price comparison engines. The top right there is a, a price comparison service called Camel 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 which gives you live price data from Amazon on the changing prices of name products. So you know exactly the point at which to make the right, the right purchase because that's the cheapest it's been for the last three months. Um, and we have techniques like algorithmic marketing which uh, do matching of products. Amazon will tell us people that bought this bought that. So taking away some of the service that retailers would have provided and guiding you to a purchase. Um, to our own activity, crowdsourced insight through Pinterest, through reviews on Amazon or TripAdvisor. We're doing the work of retailers as consumers in telling our fellow consumers about uh, the merits or otherwise of products or services. Um, and uh, therefore, personal productivity is, is improving in one respect, but actually all this extra choice, it's taking us longer to make the final decision. So some of the research I've seen recently shows that uh, having access to all these information sources and all these different channels, it takes us uh, two or three times longer than it used to to make decisions now about what to buy. Because we never quite know whether we've got the lowest price or the best deal, and we're constantly sitting on the train, on the bus, at home in bed, searching for that, that, that good deal, that, that special offer. And that's slowing us down in terms of decision making. The second feature is around customer centricity and a demanding consumer. So here we see a whole series of forces and there's an English phrase Pandora's box which talks about what you don't want to do is to open Pandora's box because it, 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 it uh, throws out all kinds of uncertain uh, kind of forces. And what we see is Pandora's box has been opened for the consumer. The consumer in many, uh, 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 not just mature but emerging markets is now very now focused, focused on wanting it immediately. So we see companies pandering to that. We see Amazon with Amazon dash buttons. So if you run out of washing powder, you press the button and it replenishes it from your kitchen. Um, we see move towards personalization uh, through uh, personalized shoe uh, offers like Shoes of Prey, Australian business. It's very, very successful in, in customizing women's shoes design. Um, uh, Stitch Fix, which is um, a personal stylist service. Uh, so providing you know, much more personalized experiences uh, that don't require stores for their success. Um, and so we, we see uh, some really uh, interesting challenges for traditional retailers to become more customer centric in that respect. The second sources of uncertainty are around competition. And here we see you know, new kinds of competition for traditional retailers emerging. Logistics businesses, payment providers, uh, customers themselves setting up their own retail businesses on eBay or on Pinterest. Uh, a business like Alibaba.com and its singles day in China just last week took something like a billion uh, dollars in the first minute of trading. Um, and we see new kinds of organizations like Amazon going into grocery in the UK. Uh, and uh, here's a Chinese business uh, called Xiaomi, uh, which actually is a mobile phone company, but also happens to be the third biggest e-commerce platform in China now, uh, in uh, five years, it's grown to that position. So substantially new forms of competition. And finally, you know, new challenges through distribution technology, which again put pressure on infrastructure, put pressure on places. Um, home delivery you know, in the UK has been historically an essential part of, uh, of, of, of the infrastructure for e-commerce. That's proving to be very, very expensive for firms now. And they're trying to move to click and collect strategies or to uh, hubs for, uh, for distribution uh, and trying to make their, uh, their distribution systems more efficient and that means getting access to convenient locations in towns and cities for consumers to pick up goods and services um, uh, but it also means that they outsource some of this to make it more efficient and just yesterday we saw some stories about Amazon in the UK uh, giving their uh, van drivers so much delivery to do during a day, 200 deliveries in one day, that actually they're breaking the speed limit, they're not wearing seat belts, they're actually, it's dangerous uh, in that respect to get things to people's houses in time, um, otherwise they don't get paid. Uh, and whilst we can see some longer term potential 
uh, uh, innovation here around self-driving vehicles, around 3D printing and so on, those are still somewhere away in terms of delivering genuinely different uh, business models for uh, commercial retail organizations. So finally, um, where does that leave us, the store of the future? Well, certainly in many UK cities and towns, there is a sense of going beyond retail, thinking about the kinds of things you can't do I I online, services, uh, health and beauty, uh, personal services, leisure services, restaurants, and so on. The kind of tourist opportunities that I showed you at Vista Village. But there are kind of three themes that many retailers pick up on that I talk to. One, of course, is around greater convenience. So interesting hearing about the new harbour development here and thinking, well, what kinds of retailing will people want in that sort of area? I stayed uh, a few years ago at uh, um, Islands Brigham in Copenhagen for a, a week or so, uh, and the apartment I rented was just above an Irma uh, high-end supermarket, which is open on Christmas Day. It was wonderful. So uh, I had everything I needed. It was very convenient, you know, but that was the only store in that area. Um, uh, but we can see across Europe, you know, uh, and indeed internationally, the growth of convenience outlets, whether it's Albert Hein to go in the Netherlands, whether it's 7-Eleven in Southeast Asia, uh, whether it's uh, Argos, which is a, a, a catalogue showroom in the UK, all offering uh, seamless convenience for, for shoppers. Or is it about the personal informational piece? So here is uh, Westfield, the Australian shopping centre company, offering a fashion lounge with personal stylists, uh, or the Apple experience in stores. Or this is an independent bookshop called Mr B's Emporium of Reading Delights. This is a wonderful place where they'll bring you tea and cake while you browse bookshelves. And that's a real kind of nice experience to have. So there is a way in which physical stores can offer services that online can't. You try ordering tea and cakes on Amazon. It's, uh, not quite so convenient. And the final piece is around experiential. And certainly when you look around what companies are doing, uh, if you go to uh, Italy or New York, you see places like Italy, slow food, very, very successful, very popular kinds of operations, which are about the experience of buying food. Uh, that is in Japan, in Osaka, where a department store company has taken three floors out of its department store to create an atrium, uh, offering exhibition space. And when I was there, uh, last year, they, are, they were doing a, a festival of France. Nothing like France, but none of the customers have ever been to France. They wouldn't know the difference. Um, but it was very, very successful and very busy on a Monday morning. Uh, and here we see people like Riet um, doing uh, climbing walls and uh, climbing frames within their lifestyle leisure centres. So uh, convenience, personalisation, experiential are all possible, but they're all quite expensive. And I think as those uh, responsible for locations and destinations have to think quite carefully about what kind of retail, uh, how that retail will function, and what role other kinds of uses will play to substitute for the retail that won't be there anymore over the next few years. So let me stop there. I think we've got just a few moments for questions. I've overrun slightly, but uh, thank you for your patience.